This morning's reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. About 20 years ago, my partner and I were seated on the patio of a little restaurant outside the ancient city of Corinth in Greece. We were on our honeymoon, and as pastors are wont to do, we decided to visit some of the sites the Apostle Paul visited 2,000 years ago. When we had finished our meal, the owner approached our table and said emphatically, Oui, café, no pay. Oui, café, no pay. And then he left. Now, we didn't understand the language, so we were unsure what was happening. When he returned, it became apparent. Oui, café, Greek for two coffees, no pay, English for on the house. <laughs> At the time, we were both tea drinkers, so it took us about 20 minutes to drain the contents of those tiny little cups. But while we imbibed that strong coffee, we looked out onto the ancient city and imagined what it must have been like when our scripture lesson was written. Our inability to understand the owner of the restaurant gave me some insight into today's text. Biblical scholars suggest Paul walked the streets of ancient Corinth around the year 50 of the Common Era. He was a traveling missionary preaching the good news of Christ to those who would listen. And... Having met a receptive crowd in Corinth, he founded a church there. In the Newer Testament of our Bible, we find two of Paul's letters to this church. You certainly would recognize portions from the first letter. It contains the famous, love is patient, love is kind text. The second letter from which we read today presents a little different tone. It is apparent that as time passed, the members of the Corinthian church became dissatisfied with Paul and his teachings. They accused him of vacillating, changing his tune, flip-flopping perhaps. Clues in Paul's letters suggest some found his message difficult to understand. It was veiled. Maybe you could say they didn't understand the language Paul used when he presented the message God called him to share. So Paul, in his writing, addresses these critics head on. And he tries to make his message as plain and clear and understandable as he can. In essence, he said, I did not found the church in order to draw attention to myself. No, I founded it to proclaim the sovereignty of Jesus Christ and myself as your servant for Christ's sake. In his own words, Paul wrote, For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God 
in the face of Jesus Christ. Little has changed in the last 2,000 years. We who call ourselves Christians today are asked to share that message in plain, clear, and understandable language. We don't gather on Sunday morning to worship ourselves or one another. Now we come to worship God, whom we have come to know through the stories of the women, men, children, and youth whose lives are recorded in our scripture. Yes, through the life, death, and continued presence of Christ. Through our own experiences of the Holy Spirit and the experiences of those who warmed these pews before us. We come to church not because it is our own. Not because it belongs to me or to you or to the ones who put the most in the offering plate each week or, or even the ones who put in the least. No, we come because we believe this church belongs to God whose spirit guides us through each and every day. We come because we believe God has spoken to our ancestors in the faith and because we believe that God is still speaking today. And yet, even as we come to offer our hearts to God in worship and to seek God's guidance in our lives, we know that there are those who do not come, who stay away, who would rather do anything on a Sunday morning than cross the threshold of our doors and sit in these pews. And they do that in part for the same reasons they did when the Apostle Paul walked the streets of ancient Corinth. Many years ago now, a member of one of my congregations sent me a link to an article posted on the National Public Radio's website, which highlighted this issue for me. This particular story was titled, A Pulpit for the Masses, YouTube, Christians Click. In part, this story reported about a language barrier which was present in most Christian churches as it pertains to communicating the good news to a generation of young adults and adults who are immersed in technology and social media. Now this article is about 10 years old now, but it's still relevant. You can recognize this barrier in, in two ways. The first is the, the medium by which our faith is shared. I am standing behind a pulpit which is a little too traditional for some. Even these pews are too traditional and this building is too traditional. Now, that's probably not true for most of us in this sanctuary today. If you are in any way similar to the folks I have worshipped with over the years, then I can guess some of the reasons why you are here today. For some, music and singing are very important to you, and for others, that's not the case. For some, the sermon is what keeps you coming, and for others, I've already been speaking for too long. For some, moments of prayer and silent meditation are essential. And for others, moving around and passing the peace is a sacred moment. For some, sharing the sacrament of communion is an essential part of life. And others will pass when it is offered. For some, worshiping in community has been a lifelong habit. And for others, a newfound joy. But if this article I read online is to be believed, we may be missing something that is important to a lot of folks out there. And perhaps we better start incorporating some more of, of these into our, 
our communal life. Now, I've already talked about the QR code that was at the top of our uh, bulletin. Again, if, if you have a smartphone or a tablet of any kind, you can probably access it if you, if you know how. The second QR code, the one that I used as my sermon title, should take you to one of the daily devotional readings offered by Reverend Molly Basquet, a UCC pastor who serves a congregation in, in California. If you haven't yet discovered this online resource offered by our denomination, I encourage you to explore the website ucc.org, which is very similar to this congregation's ucckeen.org. Anyway, the article suggested that folks who recognize these symbols need the church to start talking their language, to start using the internet to enhance their ministries, to start using technology to share the good news, to start using social media as a means of connecting people. And many of you know how well you are doing in this area. It may be the reason why you found this place, this congregation, in the first place. It may be how you are streaming this service in your home or when you are traveling or, or when you are new and want to be a little less conspicuous while church shopping. But listen to the focal point of that NPR story. It highlights a young man named Jefferson Benthke who posted a rather provocative video online titled, Why I Hate Religion But Love Jesus. It's a well-produced video in which he recites a poem. The opening line is, What if I told you Jesus came to abolish religion? For the next four minutes, he presents the reasons why he thinks religion and Jesus are on the opposite sides of the spectrum. It sparked a lot of conversation and debate and backlash online. Did I mention that his video was viewed over 19 million times in the first eight days it was posted? Who, who runs the, the church YouTube page here? 19 million, that's about the, the number of times that my sermon will be viewed this week online. Is that right? <laughs> yes? Okay, thank you. I say that to uh, point out that that's a lot of attention, which led to a lot of scrutiny. So before I get into the content of his message, let me just say I have some sense of empathy for the then 22-year-old young man who posted a poem on the internet only to learn that it had become a sensation overnight. That said, I am going to scrutinize it a little bit because I think his poem accurately depicts another kind of language barrier which is present for a lot of people today. In many circles, the word religion has a pretty bad reputation these days. His poem suggests that religion is the infection that Jesus came to cure, that religion neglected the poor, disowned single moms, and in general, enslaved the masses for their own worldly benefit. Our own denomination, the United Church of Christ, investigated the general public's perceptions of Christianity several years back now and found very similar sentiments. People thought that the church was too judgmental, intolerant, and old-fashioned, to put it nicely. And even though that has not been my own experience of Christianity and the church, I recognize that those words and that language speak to someone else's direct experience and perceptions. Which is all the more reason why we need to shout it from the mountaintop or from the steepletop 
and definitely through our technological resources, that the church and Christianity as a whole hear God speaking to us today, nudging us to embrace change, empowering us to help our neighbors, commanding us to take care of the environment in which we live and breathe and depend upon for our very survival compelling us to offer hospitality to all of our siblings who were created in God's image, each and every one of them. And, importantly, fixing our eyes upon the one whom we have come to worship each and every week. Yes, each and every day. I can agree with Bethke on that point, that what we do together as a community should always be done in the name of our gracious and loving God, who is our focus and in whom we share a common language. That's a message worth proclaiming as clearly and plainly and as understandably as we can through whatever medium is at our disposal. So maybe you'll share your bulletin with someone who knows how to use QR codes when you leave this sanctuary. Maybe you'll post something on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube that draws attention to the love that lives here. Or maybe you'll do it the old-fashioned way and you'll get on your landline in your kitchen and call a friend and invite them to join you at worship next week. However you share it, make it plain, make it clear,